What's up, students? Hope you're having the best day of your life today. Today, we are going to learn a little bit more about modern physics, primarily nuclear reactions, and this is going to be one of two parts. This would be good for anybody that's taking the SAT physics exam. This would be everything you need to know for sure, an upper-level physics class, or maybe your first-year one-on-one type of physics course, everything you really need to know, scratch-of-the-surface type stuff. So in this video, we're going to talk about Quarks and nucleons, a little bit of review from chem, those protons and neutrons just being in the nucleus. We're going to talk about subatomic particles, alpha particle, beta particles, gamma rays, neutrinos, and antineutrinos. We're going to talk about isotopes and how isotopes lead to nuclear reactions, the nuclear strong force, which is going to be a force inside the nucleus that holds the nucleus together and also is responsible for why it sometimes splits apart. And then we will introduce E equals MC squared, the most famous physics formula there is. Let's dive right into it. So in the last lesson, we looked at the atom and it had a nucleus, and then around it were the electrons that occupied some energy level. So there was electrons out here. Well, nuclear reactions are going to look at just the nucleus itself. So inside the nucleus, we have two things. We have protons and we have neutrons. And from chemistry, remember that the number of protons is equal to the atomic number. And the sum of the protons plus the neutrons is going to give us the atomic mass. Now, atomic number, it can't change, right? We can't change the amount of protons. When we change the number of protons, it now becomes a completely different element. And that completely different element, we say it goes through a process known as transmutation. So this is going from one element to another. And it's done so by changing the proton number. Now, the atomic mass, that can change. I can vary the amount of neutrons, Okay, and this changing of the neutrons and the stability of the nucleus when I do so is going to be the major contributing factor when it comes to nuclear reactions. And before we dive into that, it's also worth noting that these are not the smallest particles that we know of right now. We know of something called quarks, and I just want to talk about quarks really quick. Quarks are elementary particles that compose or make up protons, neutrons, and other subatomic particles. There are six of them. They are called up down, top, bottom, charm, and strange. And they each have their own fractional charge that sum up to the charge of a proton, neutron, etc., but they can never exist on their own. And that makes sense because we learned in electricity when we learned about electrostatics that you can't have a fraction of a charge that exists in nature. And these quarks combining to make all these particles is something that we now call the standard model of particle physics. So when you see the standard model, that just means that we have quarks that are making up all of these protons, neutrons, and other subatomic particles. And some other vocabulary that we should definitely know before we go a little bit further is that instead of just referring to these as protons and neutrons, anything that's inside the nucleus, we call nucleons. Right, so we'll say that the nucleons make up the atomic mass. Let's talk about the subatomic particles now. And these would be subatomic particles that we are going to see most commonly in nuclear reactions. And a lot of these you might have heard of before. And there's going to be some specific information that we're going to want to know about each particle. So I'm going to make kind of like a little table. And things like its exact mass and, and its exact charges and things like that are not going to be important. But you should definitely know like which ones are the heavier ones, which ones are in the nucleus, which ones are not in the nucleus, which ones um, happen after a nuclear reaction, things like that. So that's really what I want to talk about. So first I'm going to list them. We're going to list the proton the neutron, the electron, and those are going to be the most common ones that you've probably heard of. Now we're going to talk about other ones called a neutrino, an antineutrino, an alpha particle, which we learned in the last lesson was really just a helium nucleus, a beta particle, and a gamma ray. Let's get the easy ones out of the way first. We know a proton has an atomic number of one and a mass of one. A neutron has an atomic number of zero and a mass of one because there's no protons. And the electron, it's listed as negative one with a mass of zero. Its charge is plus one elementary charge, zero elementary charges, and minus one elementary charges. And it has a mass roughly one AMU, one AMU, and zero AMU. And it's worth noting this is a little bit heavier. And we'll see why that's important a little bit later. 
So now what is this neutrino? The neutrino is a product of radioactive decay and other nuclear reactions. It's going to have very little mass and no charge. Well, why is charge important? Well, charge, let's just, if it doesn't have any charge, we know that it's not going to be affected by an electric field. And these are actually more common in the universe than even protons and neutrons. Their symbol is just given by what looks like a little V with a little E. And it's antineutrino, which is the exact same thing, but it's antiparticle. When we see antiparticles, we just put a bar over it. So the antineutrino, which is right here, is just shown by this symbol here. So just like here, we need to know its symbol, which is given here. It does not have any charge, so this would be 0e, and has very little mass, 0amu. The alpha particle, as I stated just a second ago, is just the helium nucleus without any electrons. We're going to show this in two different ways. We'll call it alpha with a 2 and a 4, or we can just say it's helium, 2 or a 4. So when we look at this symbol and we're going to balance nuclear reactions, we see that when we have some sort of alpha particle leave a reaction, its mass number is going to decrease by 4, and its atomic number, or the amount of protons, is going to decrease by 2, and we'll see that in just a second. It's also worth noting that this is the most massive, so when we think heavy subatomic particles, we think about alpha particles, and we think that, and we also worth noting that it is positively charged. And that makes sense because it has two protons and it has no electrons. And because it has a positive charge, it's going to interact with the electric and magnetic field just like any other positively charged particle would. Now, a beta particle is actually pretty interesting. It is an electron that's produced when a neutron undergoes a transmutation to become a proton. So when we have a neutron that becomes a proton, an electron is spit out. That is a beta particle. And it's given by the, electro, by the electron symbol of 0 minus 1. And that's why I said it was a little bit heavier than a proton. So we had the mass of the proton plus this little bit. And we know that little bit was really the electron. So it became the proton. It decreased mass a little bit. Where did that mass go? It went into becoming this electron in a beta particle during this transmutation process. And this just happens under the right condition where a neutron just spontaneously divides and becomes that. And you, you'll see this written as 0, 1, a neutron it becomes a 1,1 one, one proton plus a beta particle and then with some antineutrino. So this would be an example of what you might see when you see a nuclear reaction. And just like anything in chemistry, all the masses have to stay conserved. We have 1 and 1, 0 and 0, so everything's good. And then we have a 0 start. We have a proton and a minus 1, that equals 0. So this is all balanced, just like we learned in chemistry. Now, because it has this electric charge, it's going to interact with the magnetic field or an electric field in the same way that an electron would. It has a ton of energy, but its mass is so, so small. They're like the mass of like a, a piece of hair as composed of your entire body when it comes to an electron versus a proton. And the last one I want to talk about is gamma, and I'm going to put gamma up here just so I keep all these on the same page for you guys so you can screenshot it or whatever. Now, we learned in the last lesson that electrons can absorb photon energy and go up in energy level and then come back down. Protons and neutrons can also move between energy levels within the nucleus. Well, when an electron falls down an energy level, it gives off a photon. When a proton or neutron drop down, a gamma ray is going to be emitted, not a photon. So they are given off when nucleons drop energy levels. They're given by like this fancy like looking V kind of thing. And they have no mass and no charge. And it's worth noting that these are electromagnetic radiation. So they travel the speed of light and they're located on the electromagnetic spectrum. And because, like I said, they don't have a mass and they don't have a charge, they are not influenced by an electric or a magnetic field. So we learn in chemistry that an isotope is the same element, but it has a different number of neutrons. Now, when this happens the nucleus can become instable. This instability is what makes nuclear reactions occur. Now, also inside the nucleus, there's something called the strong force. Now, have you ever wondered why inside the nucleus we have all these protons, right? We have a P, a P, a P. Well, the electrostatic force says that all of these, which are the likes, that they, there should be a repel from the electrostatic force. But this is not the case. The strong force is the force that keeps the nucleus together. It is mo much stronger than the electrostatic force. But the catch is it only works at very, very, very close distances. 
Now, also, there's some mass here to these protons, so there is a gravitational force as well, but gravity is so weak, guys, so weak that the electrostatic force would dominate the gravitational force in an instant. Now, because of this close distance, as I add neutrons to the nucleus, it's going to space out these protons a little bit further and further. So by adding neutrons, the nucleus, you know, it, it, it changes and the stability changes as I add more neutrons to the nucleus. So there's like an optimal mix. So now when the number of protons and neutrons like goes outside this optimal mix, the geometry of the nucleus weakens and it just, the strong force can't act the way it wants to. So this allows the electrostatic force to now come in and start breaking this nucleus apart. That's when the transmutation happens, when these proton numbers change and we start to get these radioactive subatomic particles. So when a nuclear reaction takes place, energy and mass must be conserved. And Albert Einstein showed us that this energy and mass, it can be equivalent, like each energy has an equivalent amount of mass associated with it, and each mass has a certain amount of energy that's associated with it. Now, if we remember from chemistry, we have reactants, and then we had the arrow, and then we had the products, right? And what we saw early on is that the mass of the reactants was not equal to the mass of the product. There was kind of like a mass defect. And that mass defect, we found out, had this equivalent energy. And it's given by the formula E equals mc squared. This formula is the mass energy equivalence formula. And if you've ever seen anything with physics, you've definitely seen this formula. It's probably the most popular formula in all of physics. And all of it's saying is that I have some energy... It has some sort of mass equivalence that's related to the speed of light squared, and some mass defect has an equal amount of energy as well. So because I can convert energy into mass and mass into energy, when I have a different amount of mass in the product side than the reactant side, I can convert the little bit of energy that's given off, and that would equal the mass defect that's missing inside the products. So essentially, we can look at these nuclear, react these nuclear reactions as reactants really equals the products plus the ch change in mass. So this is the mass defect. There's really supposed to be a delta out in front of here. It just doesn't look as cool as E equals mc squared. So if we look at that like creation of the beta particle before, when I looked at 1, 0, n, and that equaled a 1, 1 proton plus a 0, 1 electron plus a neutrino, an antineutrino. It's really, there's a plus M over here as well. And we saw that if we took the mass units, like the neutron has 1.00866 atomic units. And you have to memorize this, I'm just showing you. A proton has a 1.00728 atomic mass unit. An electron has a 0.00055. An antineutrino has no mass, so that'd be the plus m. So the mass defect here, delta m, was really 0 0.00083 atomic mass units, which can be converted into some energy as well. And instead of saying this mass, this delta m, you might also just see them write plus energy. So then using this formula, we could take that 0 0.00083u. And we can convert that to kilograms, right? There's a 1.66 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms in one atomic mass unit. That would be something that'd be given to you. So this mass defect really has a mass of 1.38 times 10 to the minus 30 kilograms. I can then take this mass, multiply it by the speed of light, which is 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, and don't forget to square that, I can now say that this energy right here really had a value of 1.24 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. So this is how we'd show that 0 0.00083 atomic mass units has an equivalent energy of 1.24 times 10 to the minus 13. When I make it available, guys, I will put part two of this video right here. You can click it, go on to the next one. It talks about radioactive decay, alpha decay, beta decay, half-lives, and why that's important for carbon dating. Also, fission reactions and nuclear reactors, and then fusion and how that is also used in nuclear reactions as well. You guys can always click right here if you want to subscribe for more content. Until I see you on the next one, guys, have yourselves a great day.